So welcome again. My name is uh, Avner Vishnitsa and I'm an activist in uh, Combatants for Peace. Uh, we gather here today within the framework of our uh, water campaign, First for Life, which promotes free and equal access to water for Palestinians living in Area C of the occupied West Bank. We believe that the denial of such access is among the worst types of institutional violence the Palestinians are subject to in those areas. Although certainly not the only type. Um, this, uh, what we, um, we're going to show now, happened just yesterday in uh, Khalat al dabe which is very close to Mufakara, where we held two of our water campaign activities uh, a few months ago. So, um, Eli, can you screen it? So what you see here is uh, just yesterday in the South Hebron Hills, the demolition of uh, uh, a water system, Palestinian water system, one of four that was demolished uh, yesterday. Uh, at the same time, the illegal Jewish outpost of Igai, just two kilometers away, is connected to the water grid and enjoys unlimited supply. So um, this, outrageous discrimination in access to water is not incidental. It is one more tool used by Israel to limit Palestinian lives in area C and push them out to areas A and B. There are other tools, but since water is literally uh, the most basic condition for human life, for any kind of life, we chose to focus the campaign precisely on this aspect. Hence, first, for life. About a week ago, we launched the second phase of this campaign with a letter we sent to Israeli Minister Benny Gantz, who is in charge of the Israeli army, the sovereign in Area C of the occupied West Bank. In the letter, we urge Gantz to prohibit the destruction, confiscation, or expropriation of water tankers, tractors, and other equipment intended to, trans to the transport and storage of water in Area C. We call for the removal of all time limits placed on traffic with water tanks in West Bank. West Bank residents will be able to move water tankers any day and whenever they wish. In addition, we demand allowing Palestinians to access, maintain and renovate water systems of the kind you just saw, and to dismantle fences set up by settlers around a series of spring and water sources, which prevent the indigenous inhabitants and their animals to, uh, uh, from using the water. In the coming weeks, we uh, plan a whole range of activities which will culminate toward the 22nd of March, the UN's World Water Day in a big rally. Please follow, up, follow us on uh, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for more details. You can also donate to the campaign in the link that you will see in the chat. In parallel to our activities, we are trying uh, hard to educate ourselves about the water issue. This is already the third webinar we are holding as part of this effort. Our aim, to, aim today is first to tie man-made water scarcity in area C of the West Bank to wider environmental concerns. The climate crisis is already hitting hard and is aggravating the effect of Israeli policies on Palestinian communities. Thus, we will start from this wider environmental angle and then zoom in. First, we'll hear Nadal Majdalani. Uh, Nadal is the Palestinian director of EcoPeace Middle East. She served previously in several leading technical positions in water and sanitation infrastructure projects with various international organizations. The second speaker will be Dro Etkes from Kerem Navot. Or is a long time researcher, he says too long, uh, who deals with Israeli land and settlement policy in the West Bank. And I, I, should, I should add that Dor is among the foremost experts on these issues in Israel. Dor will speak to us about how Israel manages or mismanages water resources in the occupied West Bank. Finally, our last speaker will be Atman Nawajai, 
from the Palestinian vill village of Susia in the South Hebron Hills. Fatma is a social worker and a time anti occupation activist and the head of the Rural Wo Women Association. Uh, Fatma will tell us what it means and how it feels to live under these worsening conditions of man made and environmental water scarcity. Each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes and then we will take time to answer questions. You're welcome to write your questions in the chat. We plan to end at uh, 9.15 local time. So uh, Nadar, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, thank you, Avner, and uh, thank you for Combatants for Peace uh, for this uh, wonderful opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll start um, with the non-man-made conditions, uh, first of all, to give a broader picture on the issue of uh, water security um, in, in the region in general. Um, this is a, an illustration of how climate change uh, basically is affecting the MENA region in several areas um, and how water basically uh, insecurity is um, affecting several countries of the MENA region and how basically in literature and in many cases um, in, in many uh, basically uh, security establishments and security institutions have identified that water security and climate change uh, um, impacts are basically exacerbating um, existing tensions uh, uh, in terms of political tensions of, or violent, um, uh, basically, conflicts. Um, and in that sense, when we look at the um, climate change impacts on the MENA region, uh, we expect that by the end of the century, we will uh, expect uh, an increase of temperature um, of about 4 to 7 degrees Celsius. Um, according to uh, recent studies. Um, and this is very high in comparison of the rest of the world, uh, at which uh, the rest of the world is expecting um, an increase of one to three degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Um, and how does this affect uh, basically precipitation? Uh, these are, this is data from uh, 2018, uh, basically published by um, the Tel Aviv University. Um, and it shows basically projections of precipitation and, uh, and rainfall. Um, and it shows how in the past, basically winter, um, uh, spring, summer, autumn uh, uh, frequency and length uh, was, uh, was pretty uh, organized in a manner that the um, uh, precipitation season or the wet season is from January to, to approximately May, uh, which allowed um, appropriate recharge of the aquifers and uh, and sustainable recharge of uh, of the existing resources and natural resources. Uh, this was until 2005, but as we see projections to the end of the century, uh, we will uh, face shorter uh, winters and longer summer seasons. Um, this reflects immediately on the precipitation rates will be also decreased by the end of the century by 13, uh, 30%, 3 zero. Um, this is the average uh, prediction. Um, how does this reflect on the existing um, uh, uh, nature resources? Uh, pretty much uh, a lot. Uh, specifically, uh, when we speak about uh, the uh, exacerbation of the situation uh, uh, by the combination of um, uh, of the uh, climate change and natural uh, impacts uh, and the man-made impacts which are reflected by uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and, uh, uh, and the occupation. Um, and, and unfortunately, the, the uh, equation in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, allocation of water resources between Palestinians and Israelis uh, has um, been stuck and has been held hostage uh, since the Oslo Accords. Um, when Oslo was uh, striked as a five years interim agreement, um, water issues was put as one of the final five, uh, five final status issues to be discussed um, uh, towards the final agreement, along with the other difficult issues 
uh, including the um, uh, borders of the uh, state of Palestine, the illegal settlements, um, the, uh, uh, um, uh, the status of Jerusalem and the status of refugees. And therefore, um, uh, water issues uh, became hostage to the paradigm of solving all the issues um, uh, or nothing. Um, in that sense, um, and in, in Article 40 on the Oslo Accords, which was supposed to be only for an interim period of five years, uh, first of all, it did not mention the Palestinian water rights to the uh, Jordan River. Uh, second, it allocated uh, approximately 120 million cubic meters of um, uh, fresh water from uh, shared aquifers, mainly the mountain aquifer, and uh, another uh, 80 to be immediately uh, also supplied. Um, and on the condition as well that uh, uh, after uh, basically the, uh, the Eastern aquifer, which is mostly located within um, uh, or almost entirely located within the Jordan Valley areas and area C in the Jordan Valley um, uh, is basically 50% uh, uh, utilized by, um, uh, uh, by Israel and, and mostly by Israeli settlements um, and the, uh, a bit less than 50% uh, also by the Palestinians. Um, and in that sense, Oslo Accords also supposed that the full uh, share of, uh, of the mountain aquifer should go to the Palestinian Authority. Um, in that sense, we can uh, see as well that um, uh, until, until the moment, um, uh, Israel takes the lion's share from the mountain aquifer, of which 85% is uh, of it is located in the West Bank areas. Um, however, Israel is uh, allocated for a 75% of utilization of this aquifer, uh, while the Palestinian Authority only holds 25% of this uh, utilization. Um, so in that sense, uh, the, uh, Israel takes the lion's share of natural water resources, according to Oslo. And um, the improvement of any uh, water infrastructure or uh, new water resources and natural water resources is basically governed by the, uh, what is called the Joint Water Committee, which also is a mechanism that has um, proven over the years to be kaput. Uh, several of the water wells uh, uh, projects that were proposed by the Palestinians have been vetoed by, uh, by the Israeli uh, um, uh, members of the Joint Committee. Uh, and several uh, of the uh, water infrastructure projects have been impeded to be developed uh, within uh, Area C specifically um, uh, by the Israeli military. Um, and therefore, uh, improving the, the infrastructure situation in the West Bank uh, specifically and Gaza, I'll, I'll mention a few about it uh, um, ahead in this presentation, uh, is pretty much um, uh, hindered uh, uh, by, the, uh, uh, by the military control. Um, not only that this affects uh, uh, the general outlook of, of, um, of the water sector, but it immediately impacts the situation on ground for each and every Palestinian home and citizen. Um, uh, this is real life, these are real life photos of some communities in the West Bank, which basically suffer water shortages. Um, in average, the Palestinian gets around 70 uh, liters uh, best, um, at best cases, uh, 70 to 80 liters per capita per day. Um, and uh, in some areas in the West Bank, and especially from Yatta and southern areas of the West Bank, um, such as uh, the Masafer, where Fatma is coming from, she will give us a, a deeper look on the situation on ground. Uh, they get uh, not more than 23 to 28 liters per capita per day. And this is way below the recommendations of the World Health Organization. Um, so in terms of, uh, of some uh, mechanisms of that the communities utilize in order to get more water, uh, they utilize uh, trucks or water tankers. Uh, uh, and this is basically purchased from private wells or private filling points. 
the price of a 10 uh, cubic meter tanker, uh, which could sustain a family of five to six people for about a week, costs about uh, 400 shekels. Uh, if you multiply that by four towards the end of the uh, of the month, this makes up approximately the entire income of a family or a household uh, in some communities. Um, uh, the, the system is irregulated and sometimes also the quality of the water is jeopardized um, uh, in that sense. Um, the situation exacerbates more in Gaza Strip where 97% of the aquifer is not suitable for human consumption because of over pumping. Um, and because uh, both from the Israeli uh, wells on, in the, on the coastal aquifer in, in Israel and in the Negev, um, and from the Palestinian over pumping. Um, and the situation exacerbates towards um, uh, the inability of the Palestinian Authority to provide services to their citizens. And in that sense, the uh, Palestinian Authority is forced to purchase water from the Israeli company, uh, Mekorot, uh, with an average of 250 million shekels per year. This is a huge number. This is approximately uh, 80 to 90 million cubic meters per year, uh, which uh, back then in 2000, uh, in, sorry, in, in uh, 1995 in Oslo, this was supposed to be the amount that the Palestinians should get immediately for emergency needs. And unfortunately, at the moment, we uh, actually buy this, uh, this quantity. Uh, not only that the situation is, uh, is, is, uh, is dire and, uh, and uh, worrying on the water sector side, but also on the sanitation side. Uh, these are transboundary streams between the West Bank <coughs> and Israel. Um, uh, these uh, streams cross the, uh, uh, the Green Line. And uh, pretty much also because of the Israeli uh, military um, uh, uh, policies in Area C, uh, several communities uh, um, in Area C cannot basically construct, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> construct wastewater treatment plants um, with advanced uh, treatment technology in order to minimize the situation and to minimize um, uh, the, uh, the sewage water that is crossing the border. Some of the sewage is from uh, municipal sources. Uh, some of the sewage is from uh, industrial sources and others basically is also mixed uh, from settlement so sources in the West Bank. This only not affects the public health of the Palestinian uh, communities, uh, but also pollutes shared water aquifers, uh, mainly the mountain aquifers uh, between Palestine and Israel. And also, um, uh, affects the public health uh, on the Israeli side. However, the Israeli uh, government basically constructs uh, wastewater treatment plants on uh, the other side of the border. And the cost of construction and treatment of the sewage is basically deducted from the taxes and Palestinian taxes, uh, which is called al-Maqassa. Uh, and this reaches up to 100 and 20 million shekels uh, uh, per year in average. Uh, and, and this basically weakens further the Palestinian Authority and this incentivizes uh, uh, for a further look into uh, 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 basically um, uh, treating the sewage. However, uh, the main reason is, as I mentioned, that most of these treatment plants should be located in Area C and uh, the permitting is taking um, a lot of uh, prolonged procedures at the Israeli civil administration. Um, and I can just give one example at the moment that is being debated is the Tulkarem. Yeah. Yeah. If you can uh, wrap up in about a minute. Yes, yeah, sure. Thank yeah. you. Um, um, and and uh, one example, as I mentioned, is the Tulkarem wastewater treatment plant, which has been um, in the discussion process uh, for over a decade, over 10 years. And this is the situation in Gaza, and it shows 
how also untreated sewage from Gaza is affecting the drinking water and water security in Israel and is causing the closure of desalination plants in Israel, in Ashkelon and other areas. Um, and it shows the interconnectedness of how the Israeli policies uh, towards Palestinians, whether in the West Bank and Gaza, are not only affecting Palestinians, but they also affecting the water security of Israel itself and the overall security uh, in the region. Um, this is also uh, a recent photo from Gaza and the floods in Gaza, which necessitates looking at um, uh, collaborative measures in order to um, uh, basically uh, address uh, shared threats and threats that, uh, that happen across the border uh, on both sides. How do, we, how do we address that? Very quickly, COPIS Middle East has proposed uh, a Green Blue Deal, uh, which addresses, uh, first of all, uh, the allocation of Palestinian water rights to the Palestinians and uh, negotiating a water agreement. The second is the exchange of water and energy between Jordan, Palestine, and Israel. And the third is a vision for the improvement of the uh, Jordan River Basin in terms of water and sanitation infrastructure, which would uplift as well the economy of the, of the Jordan Valley. And finally, a lot of education. And this is a part of what we're doing now is education, awareness, um, and on making the communities, Palestinian Israeli communities, understand the grave situation uh, um, that is linked to the occupation and to the conflict and to climate change and the necessity to work uh, things out together as if we are all in the same boat. And finally, uh, we are working on a lot of advocacy with international community in order to advance the vision of the Green Blue Deal. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Nada. Thank you so much. Um, Dlo, uh, we'll just uh, wait for the uh, presentation. And Nada, if you can, uh, okay. Thank you. Dlo, good evening. Well, yeah. please go. Good evening. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. Very well. Okay. So uh, thank you, first of all, for the chance to present here this evening. Um, I would like to speak to start with uh, an explanatory uh, or introduction or introduction or short introduction uh, to the to the issue of uh, the Israeli settlement uh, and land policy in the West Bank by saying something which I'm saying in every presentation, uh, which I speak about this uh, about this topic. In order to understand uh, the Israeli uh, policy in the West Bank, one have to uh, combine two different uh, elements. One have to think about the so-called official measures, uh, which the Israeli government is officially taking in order to uh, um, take over land, to expropriate land, and to allocate this land, these lands to um, Israeli settlers. And one have to combine or to think also about the unofficial, the so-called illegal, even according to the Israeli law measures, which is taken by different Israeli governmental uh, organs, bodies, in order to advance the same objective. So the reality on the ground is actually a com com compilation, a combination of these two, of these two parallel channels, which are working all the time. The official governmental uh, channel and the unofficial. Okay, both of them, as I said before, are aimed to uh, achieve the same task, the same goal, the same objective, which is obviously to minimize the amount of land or minimize the Palestinian presence in the West Bank, especially in Area C, not only though, and uh, to allocate as much as possible of land to uh, Israeli uh, citizens who are encouraged by the Israeli government to move to the West Bank. In this context, saying that, I would like to speak now to go and speak about the water issue and to exemplify what I just said in the context of the, uh, of the water policy, Israel, Israel's uh, water policy in, in the West Bank. So 
what you see here, this is, uh, this is not too far away from, from where uh, uh, the video, which uh, Avner showed you before, uh, is uh, it's in Yatta area and it's uh, basically a dismantlement or demolition of water pipes, water infrastructure, which had been uh, laid by Palestinian in order to uh, in order to bring water to Palestinian communities in the uh, Masafar Yatta area. What we see here, basically the civil administration, workers or employees by, of the civil administration, which are dismantling this uh, water uh, uh, infrastructure. Same thing here, we can see the Israeli soldier. Now, I would like to, to um, divide my presentation to three different uh, aspects. Uh, I will start with the water pit, so, pit, so or the water cistern. The system, the traditional uh, system, which the Palestinian indigenous communities in the West Bank are using for generations in order to accumulate water, in order to catch water in the rainy season. And um, this is especially important in the southern part of the West Bank, which are more arid, where there's less rain, there's less uh, um, rainy days every year, and therefore it's uh, vital to catch water uh, in order to use them during, uh, during the entire uh, year. So what we see here, these are two Israeli settlements, the settlement of Maon and the settlement of Carmel, which are located in the southeastern uh, uh, Yatta uh, area. In the southern southeastern part of the of the West Bank, the blue stains which you see on the on the area photo, these are the areas which had been declared by the Israeli uh, by the Israeli by the Israeli government as uh, state land had been allocated officially to the Israeli uh, Israeli settlement. Looking at few few thousands of dunams uh, altogether, which had been uh, allocated to these two Israeli settlements, and you can see that around them there are Palestinian communities. Yeah, you can see small Palestinian communities. These are herding communities, which are um, uh, affiliated to the Yatta, to the big Yatta area. These are old families, which are part of the uh, Yatta population, which traditionally is spread all over all the area where, where, you know, all the Yatta's, all the Yatta's land, which by the way, big part of it was lost for the Palestinian in 1948. Big part of the Yatta area is actually south of the Green Line in what today or what since 1948 had become uh, the state of Israel. So what you see here, uh, these two uh, stains, these two uh, red uh, circles are showing you these two water cisterns. This is close up photo, yeah. You can see this is a cistern and this is a cistern. And uh, these are cisterns which are uh, built way before the settlers have been there. How do we know? Because we have uh, historical aerial photos which uh, show us. This is an aerial photo from the beginning of the 1980s. Okay, and we can see that the, uh, that the water cisterns were already here. These two settlements were established in the beginning of the 1980s. And um, these two uh, water cisterns are actually unaccessible to Palestinians. They are unaccessible to Palestinians today because they are within the so-called the, um, the jurisdictional area of Israeli settlement. Now, all the jurisdictional area in the, uh, of Israeli settlement in the West Bank are defined officially by the Israeli government since 1997 as closed military zone for Palestinians. So officially, if a Palestinian enters into this, uh, this area, he uh, can be punished for it. Yeah? Uh, we're talking about altogether over 500,000 dunams, uh, which had been allocated specifically to Israeli settlement, like these two settlements, and had become part of the so-called jurisdictional area. So here we can see that these two uh, uh, pits, these two border cisterns, are located within the area which had been uh, officially expropriated from the community of Yatta and had been given to the Israeli settlers the community, the herding community, which is residing just next to this, to these two water cisterns, Ta'ala, Khibata Ta'ala, the people who live there, if a few families who are making their living from, from uh, herding, yeah, they cannot enter this, uh, this area because uh, settlers are basically violently um, preventing them from entering all the uh, blue area 
which had been declared a state land, and then I said before, had been allocated to Israeli settlers in the West. So this is one aspect. This is in order to exemplify how official, how the official channel in the West Bank uh, works. Now I would like to, uh, to go on and to show you two unofficial land grabs or two, two different unofficial typologies of, uh, of, um, of water slash land grab uh, in the West Bank. What you see here, all the blue dots are actually water um, springs, natural springs, which have been uh, targeted by Israeli settlers and are or completely blocked for Palestinian entrance or are uh, under risk, I would say. Uh, there is a risk that the Palestinians sooner or later won't be able to enter into them anymore because of uh, settlers' uh, land grab. So water springs are especially important uh, for settlers, not because of the amount of water. The amount of water is not important for both sides today. I mean, the Palestinian water economy is not dependent anymore on these water, water springs. Yeah, uh, I mean, in some cases, one family or few families can use this water, yeah, of course. But altogether, when you look at the water of the Palestinian modern water economy, so the amount of water which comes out of these water springs is not far from being sufficient to, uh, to, for the Palestinian population, right? But these water springs are important because they are um, culturally very important. And very often, they are scenic spots. Where people used to go and uh, and you know spend time, um, and for the same reason uh, they are also targeted by the Israeli by the Israeli settlers. Now, I will show you two examples. These are two uh, two springs, two water springs. One called the uh, Anil Mukhaybar and the other one is Anil Arik. One belongs to the village of Karyut between uh, Nablus and Ramallah. The other one uh, belongs to the village of uh, Lubna Sharkia, uh, also. In, uh, in the area between uh, Nablus and, and Ramallah. This, is, this road, which you see here in the middle, is actually, is actually route number 60, the main road, which uh, goes all the way from south to north in the West Bank. And from both sides of the, route, what you, of the road, what you see here is basically Israeli settlements and outposts, which had been established in this area since the beginning of the 1980s. This is the settlement of Eli up here, this part, and here, this is an, uh, an unofficial outpost, uh, which affiliated to the settlement of, uh, of Shiloh, which called Gibat Aril. And here in between, we can see the two, the two springs. Uh, I will show you how it looks from the ground. This is uh, Anil Arik. You can see the, the, the spring is actually in the middle of a very, very old and beautiful olive orchard. The whole area had been taken by, by settlers. Uh, Palestinians cannot enter, de facto. I mean, there's no fence, there's no gate, but Palestinians cannot enter because it's dangerous for Palestinians to enter this area. Uh, you can see that uh, these areas have become some kind of recreational uh, uh, spots. Uh, soldiers are being brought uh, as part of the, you know, so-called uh, uh, tours, educational tours, which a military is organizing for soldiers. And, um, and, the settlers from the neighboring uh, from the neighboring settlement Ali are coming down and become they became basically a private spring water spring, which belongs only to the uh, to the settlers and their guests and Israelis guests. I I took this uh, this photo by myself. Nobody nobody noticed because I don't I don't look like a Palestinian. So this is another, this is, uh, this is one example of what I mentioned before, the so-called illegal, unofficial uh, uh, land grab uh, channel. Yeah, in this case is being uh, subsidized and encouraged by specific settlements or by regional councils, which are, uh, which belong to the settlers, which are managed and run by the settlers, okay. In this specific case, we're talking again, the Regional Council of Binyamin, which is one of the most aggressive regional councils in West Bank, which is involved in countless, countless, literally countless amount of uh, uh, cases of, uh, of uh, land grab. And this is only one part of it, another, another, another example. Of course, once the, 
once the spring is taken by the settler, so the name is being changed. Here in this specific case, we're talking about Mayan Agvura, the, the spring of the, what is Gvura in Hebrew? Somebody can, somebody can help me here? Bravery. Wow. Bravery, thanks. Um, last, uh, last um, or another uh, example, and the last example which I would like to refer to here today is the allocation, the official allocation of, um, of the water authority, Israeli water authority to uh, settlers which are involved in sheer land grab. And uh, one of the, one of the, uh, really, one of the highlights in this, uh, con in this context is the story of uh, Psagot Winery. Psagot Winery is a, is a company basically which had been established in uh, 2003 uh, based on a, on a business which had been existing before it was established by a family which lives uh, in uh, the settlement of Psagot, which is next to El Bire, uh, the Berg family. And uh, this family had uh, basically constructed their business on nothing else than land grab. They took over dozens, just about 80 dunams of land, uh, which is around the settlement, around the settlement of Sagot. All of it is 100% uh, privately owned by Palestinian. They took it over and they could do it easily because the settlement was surrounded by fence. So it was basically very easy for them technically to take, uh, to take the land, even though they started before before the fencing of the settlement, before the, fence, the settlement was uh, was uh, totally surrounded physically by by uh, metal electronic uh, fence, and they continued after that the settlement was already uh, sealed from the rest of the of the area, and uh, they they took they took the land, and what we see here uh, is the amount of water. Now you have to you have to see you have to think that what you see or the numbers which you see sixteen point ninety seven this is thousand cubic cubic meters so we you have to multiply multiply by thousand and then another thousand in order to get the amount of liter in liters yeah so we're looking we're looking at sixteen what sixteen million liters a year which had been allocated sixteen almost seventeen thousand uh, cubic uh, uh, cubic meter. Uh, of water, which is allocated officially by the Israeli Water Authority to settlers, which are basically, which are basically involved directly in uh, Palestinian land grab. This is again another example. Well, well, if you can, if you can wrap it up in yep. about a minute. Thank yep, you. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is uh, this is uh, another way how we see that the Israeli government uh, or Israeli organ, which belongs to Israeli government, is assisting uh, settlers in order to achieve what I described before, you know, basically um, getting rid of Palestinians uh, in area C and allocating the land, taking over the land and giving it to Israeli settlers. And it's being done, as I said in the beginning, it's being done in, in, a, in an official manner. And at the same time, it's being done also in an in unofficial manner in a way that breaches Israel's, Israel's own laws. But again, the task, the objective is the same objective. This is to increase the amount of land which is allocated to Israeli settlers or, or controlled by Israeli settlers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Glo, uh, for this presentation. I encourage you all, please, to uh, write questions uh, in the chat. And also look for the links for uh, uh, our Facebook and uh, Instagram, Twitter, so that you can follow us online uh, in the coming weeks. Um, our last speaker, uh, Fatma Nawaja, please, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Hello, good evening. 
Good evening. Uh, are you hearing me good? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. Uh, as they, they introduced me, I am Fatma Nawaj. I am from Susia Village. Uh, thank you so much for having me here in, uh, in this uh, conference, campaign. Uh, I'm so happy to be uh, one of this campaign to talk about uh, my case, uh, uh, what are in South Hebron Health. Uh, as you know, the, uh, the water power everything in life. No, no life uh, if no water. Uh, we are in, in South Hebron Hills facing many years ago a problem with water uh, in, uh, in the villages like Susia, Tuani, or Melcher, all the villages in South Hebron Hills. Uh, we we cannot get water easier. We uh, and not enough water because we have more challenge. One biggest challenge the incubation. Uh, all the time, he do everything hard uh, to broken system water uh, to complicated life in South Brun Hills. Uh, to push the people out, uh, get out from the land and leave the land for settler. Uh, also, they are uh, take old wheel water and they give uh, they put them hand on this wheel and give it to the settler. We cannot get any water and arrive. Uh, they blocked this area around all this wheel. We cannot get water from this uh, wheel. Uh, it's so sad if I am as a woman, a woman in South Hebron Hills. If I look to the settler woman beside us, she coming to our land, and she get water easier. She have a system water. Uh, she uh, she have a pool. She swimming with the children. I'm so sad in myself if I look, we cannot get water for eating, for clean, for uh, sheep, for farm. For... Because that everything became less and less. For example, we have less uh, plants, you know, in the in Palestinian villages, uh, we are dependent on the plants, on the farm, uh, also on the sheep for our life. We some people they lost more plants, um, uh, uh, land plants. They, they lost sheep because no water enough. They try focusing more more important thing. Uh, other thing is difficult beside incubation effects in our life. To uh, to didn't get didn't get. Is it not easy if, if, uh, uh, if we like to uh, get our rights like everywhere with water, we're not easy. As you said, as uh, we are watch, uh, always they do destroy the system water. And in the same time, the water uh, system move beside the villages to settler, one settler in other side. The, the, for example, the system water in Sosia, I move be, be, be beside the Palestinian family, three meters, 10 meters, 30 meters, we cannot use uh, no service. The incubation always they didn't let us to get water, electricity, everything. And the st same time, uh, one of these things service the water. It's it's uh, it's like 
uh, hard in the body, the water. No one's not alive. Uh, if we are uh, any service, a special thing, water, at the same time, they go to high court and said, no services in, uh, this, in this area it is not good for life. Uh, they give the reason and they go to the high court to use the reason. Uh, really, is is uh, is very safe if we are see our water come from which bank by Mikorot, go to settlement. We cannot use the cost for us. The water is very high. For example, around thirty or thirty five for us one meter. They use in four shekel or five shekel. This is combined between these two things is very, very sad for me in Palestinian. As a Palestinian, I look, my, we lost my water. My water go to other person. And, and now nothing in my hand. What I do, which, where is, uh, where is the, uh, the human organization to help me to get my right in water? That thing, I think, uh, I hope our boys, go everywhere uh, and the people help us uh, to be alive. Anyway, we are human. We are uh, people. We have rights in the land and water. Uh, you know, uh, 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 the climate also, you know, many years ago, no rain. Uh, no more wheel because some wheels the Israeli destroy, some wheels they both hand and uh, block the area. Uh, uh, when they block, they use or block, uh, yeah, they use uh, for them or settler, and we cannot use at the same time. Uh, the climate change uh, more, the weather is more dry, no water, the land became dry. Uh, the, the life is not easy for us and for the animals to be a uh, continue without water in area C in South Hebron. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. And we will now um, take some questions. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sure there'll be also questions to you, Fatma. I will. Um, yeah. Take a few questions and uh, any of the speakers who want to address them, uh, you're more than welcome. It will be a free conversation now between us. Um, so first, um, I'd like to ask, um, uh, if, you, if any of you can explain uh, the issue of water collection. Uh, you know, I'm explaining to those of you who are not familiar with the water systems. These are not wells, but rather uh, uh, reservoirs uh, uh, that collect rainwater. And the question is, why uh, are they not allowed to collect? Uh, Palestinians are not allowed to collect uh, rainwater. It's from the sky, uh, asked whoever asked this question. So that is one question. Um, second, uh, somebody asks, uh, what can be done to change the inequities between uh, Israel and Palestine concerning water? That is a, a much larger question. Uh, and then uh, two more questions, and then we'll uh, give you a chance to, to uh, address them. Um, has anyone applied to USAID funding to address water system improvements? And then finally, uh, if water is plentiful, uh, for Israel, why do they bother to desalinate water? Okay, so um, please, Nada, Do, Fatma. Um, Nada, you want to start? Thank you. Um, well, first of all, to achieve uh, water equality or water justice, particularly for Palestinians uh, and to achieve water rights. Um, the, the ultimate goal is basically the end of the occupation. 
and uh, uh, basically for Palestinians to have um, the sovereignty over water resources um, and reaching a final agreement um, that is basically going to achieve justice and, and prosperity for all people um, around in this region. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the, the political environment uh, is, is really, the picture is really bleak uh, and we don't see uh, in any of the near future attempts that uh, the all or nothing um, approach is going to basically uh, lead us anywhere towards um, achieving peace uh, on ground, unfortunately, uh, or towards um, uh, um, basically um, achieving the Palestinian independent state uh, or ending the occupation. What we need to address today is um, uh, an immediate uh, need, which is uh, water. It's a basic human right. Uh, and it's a basic need for Palestinians. Um, in the meantime, what we can do is uh, to advocate further towards uh, um, realizing the, uh, that water security for Palestinians is the, in the interest of, of Israel. Um, it's in the interest of um, um, basically um, um, also not increasing um, the, the animosity and increasing the, uh, the tensions uh, on ground. Uh, it's in the interest uh, as well as I showed uh, that sanitation issues is also uh, an interest for Israel uh, in the West Bank. Um, and therefore maybe um, a different approach needs to be taken. Um, Water uh, as a human basic need and as a quick necessity for Palestinians today is not required to be as uh, part of a final political um, uh, resolvement um, and agreement. Uh, today, Palestinians can achieve water security um, by, by several means. Uh, today, Israel utilizes 75% of, uh, or 75% of the drinking water in Israel is from desalination. Um, and uh, almost um, uh, every, um, um, uh, almost 95% of uh, irrigation and agriculture in Israel is dependent on uh, reuse of treated wastewater. So in that sense, and to answer the fourth question, uh, of why Israel is desalinating. Desalination in Israel is um, basically to uh, achieve water security in Israel uh, and to address climate change um, uh, and shortages of water uh, in the future, but also to uh, uh, it is utilized as a commodity because uh, today there are uh, agreements between uh, Jordan and Israel at which Jordan is actually purchasing water uh, and desalinated water from Israel, and therefore, in order to, uh, uh, to enable this water sale and to uh, maintain water uh, security for Israel, Israel is, is taking a lead in desalination. Um, however, um, in that sense, and in the increased water pie, uh, Palestinians can achieve water rights from natural water resources, and um, without any uh, basically uh, change to the current situation or the future situation of Israel's water security. And that sense, there are some practical um, um, approaches that we can do in terms of uh, utilizing some modeling and some softwares that can uh, optimize today uh, water resources from natural resources and from non-conventional resources uh, in terms of optimizing the, um, uh, the source uh, and the demand areas, especially the high demand areas of major cities. Um, and these models and these softwares can very much help decision-making and very much help uh, on the second track and, third, and first track um, uh, diplomacy and negotiations in terms of achieving uh, water rights for Palestinians. This is a short-term approach that is attainable and practical and doable, and can also be utilized as a trust building measure for um, basically uh, opening political discussions on the other uh, more complicated issues in terms of the political file. Thank you, Nada. Um, 
Noel, if you can briefly uh, address the question of uh, water, uh, rain water collection, and then yeah. I have a question for Fatma. Yeah. There was, I think, a uh, misunderstanding, at least uh, the question uh, seems to to be articulated by someone who didn't uh, completely understand what I meant. Um, Palestinians are collecting water from Iran, of course. Um, there is no military command. There are many military commands in the West Bank, but there's no military command which forbid Palestinians to collect water from, uh, from Iran, uh, rainwater. Uh, what I meant before, and perhaps I, will should, I should show it again, um, when I spoke about the sister, about the water pits or cistern. What I meant is that the uh, traditional old uh, uh, pits, uh, water pits uh, system or cistern is partly in areas which had been declared as state land by the Israeli authorities up from the 19, er, early 1980s. And as I, as I showed before, these two examples here, these two pits are located within area which had been declared as state land had been allocated to Israeli settlers. And uh, especially in the last uh, two years, since uh, an outpost, since a very, very aggressive, violent outpost had been established just on the hilltop um, above, these two, above these two cisterns, Palestinians are, cannot access these, uh, the land in order to irrigate, to use the water and irrigate their, their, chef, their, their, yeah, their goats or sheep, whatever they have. So, so the, the answer is Palestinians are collecting water and, uh, and using them for you know, whatever they need. They cannot access uh, water systems which are located in, in areas which had been declared as state land, especially not in areas where uh, violent settlers are located and are preventing Palestinian herders violently from entering the areas where these uh, old uh, pits are located, like in this case. And this is of course only, these are of course only two cases out of much, much more. Um, I would like just to refer to one more question with your permission. Sure. The question, the question of uh, equality, what can be done in order to, uh, in order to um, achieve uh, um, equality in terms of uh, water dissemination between the Israelis and, uh, and Palestinians. So obviously water dissemination is uh, another angle where the inequality, the severe inequality between Palestinians and Israelis in this country uh, happens. And uh, in order to achieve, in order to achieve uh, this, uh, this equality, I guess you know, what is needed is a complete and radical change of the political system. And this is, I guess, something which we, all the speakers uh, are, are, uh, can agree about, you know, that uh, this, um, well, there's no other word besides articulating it, you know, this apartheid system has to be abolished. And it won't be abolished unless uh, people will, uh, will, uh, will make sure that it will be abolished. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, we, we have about 10 minutes and it's not much. Uh, so please, uh, um, quick answers. I just want to add to what uh, Dor said about collecting rainwater. The army does impose limitations on renovating and building uh, new water systems and even canals that are used to channel rainwater into the water systems. So all of these things are indeed uh, 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 forbidden by the military and the military, the military as you could see, is uh, uh, demolishing uh, systems. Everything, and this is to re reply to another question, we're not gonna open it now. Everything is the, the, the Palestinians built more or less is the, by definition illegal, okay? They cannot get permits for anything like that. And so anything they try to do is by definition uh, 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 subject to uh, demolition. In, in uh, area C, in area C. In important. area C, yes. Uh, and I want to uh, ask um, Fatma, um, if you can please uh, give us a few examples of uh, how you deal with the water shortages, um, um, how it affects you, your family, uh, bathing, doing laundry, uh, drinking, cooking, all of these things. If you can, if you can uh, say a few words about that. And one other uh, um, uh, okay. question 
انا آه. دار تكوستن اي ليجل فيلج تو مين يس اديتيا يو كان اولسو ادريس ذيس كويشن illegal I will try to answer you uh, quickly because I will go leave to other meeting my staff meeting uh, 15 minutes will start okay uh, the f- f- uh, first question uh, how is the water affecting my life you know the water important for everything in our life but we are focusing more more very important and under then Uh, important, important, uh, uh, between which more, more important we start. For example, if I, we are uh, want to clean home, uh, we, we didn't have enough water. Also, we need to use the water for uh, eating, drinking, for uh, for the family, for animals. Uh, we we uh, keeping water for first thing, And if we have uh, to get water, uh, if we have uh, water uh, for eat, uh, drink, for then we will go to clean. And we are we cannot clean daily like everywhere they use. We clean, uh, for example, if I have enough water and we are get our right in water, we clean daily. We get shower daily. We get, we uh, use and we plant if not very less very 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 less water just maybe i shower two time in a week or one time uh, to clean clothes one time in the week uh, to clean for example uh, for uh, plants if we have water for drinking and eating and for for uh, homework We cannot get out to do a ground a, a garden a home, home around home. We should use the water step by step. What's more important because the water is not enough, and the life in South Hebron is is very very big. You know, as people maybe some of people they visit the village villages in South they are safe. This one question, another question about Palestinian, legal or not illegal, uh, the Palestinian village legal. We can, we'll, we will uh, we will try to get our right through this campaign or every, any uh, thing other, uh, because we are illegal and Palestinian village, because we are legal and Palestinian village illegal and we are the our village all that the occupation we are on the land before the occupation coming because that we are legal we cannot compare legal or not, or not illegal we are illegal palestinian village everywhere legal that's all in the history uh, everyone they know the palestinian people legal and we are there in the land and the Israel occupation come in uh, in 1948 in our land that's my question and uh, my answer thank you thank you Fatma I will say just uh, two more words about the question of uh, illegal uh, Palestinian villages first of all as Fatma said many of them were on the ground before Israeli occupation came. Uh, second, many of them were declared illegal. For example, Masaf Riyata, uh, after Israel announced a huge tracts of land, um, closed military zone, thus rendering people already in place suddenly illegal. And the, 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 the issue of these areas is well, well documented. Uh, and even the Israeli Supreme Court decided in 2003 that they should be allowed to return to their lands after the Israeli army demolished their houses uh, in 1999. So they they were allowed to return to their lands, but not allowed to rebuild their uh, houses. So again, they live in illegal houses by Israeli definitions. Let's not forget, it's the Israeli 
military authorities that decide what is legal and what is illegal. Second, all illegal Israeli outposts posts that are illegal by Israeli definitions, not to mention the international law, are connected to the water grid. So the question of legal, illegal is completely irrelevant here. It just exposes Israel, Israel's hypocrisy uh, when using these claims. Um, we are really nearing the end of this conversation. I want to give the speakers one uh, last uh, chance to uh, last comment or answer or whatever you want to uh, say uh, briefly, please, uh, and then we'll conclude. Nada? Okay, I'll start. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, very incredible discussion. Um, uh, very good questions. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for Combatants for Peace for taking on the water issues uh, and water campaign. Uh, this is indeed one of the uh, key hot issues uh, uh, for the region. Um, a reminder for all that water security for, for Palestinians, again, is in the interest uh, of all, uh, not only from a human right perspective, uh, but also from uh, a mutual interest for Palestinians and Israelis and all in the region. Um, I try all the time to um, uh, resemble the situation of water insecurity and climate change in the region, uh, similar to the Titanic. We are all on the same boat. Uh, Israel, with its technology and lead in desalination, could be um, on the uh, first class uh, area uh, with the champagne and with um, the, uh, the ballrooms, um, whilst um, uh, Palestinians and Jordanians and uh, many countries around the region um, are basically uh, at the bottom of the ship. But once the iceberg hits, we all sink. Nobody is prone to water insecurity. It reflects on the security of everyone in the region. And again, um, water is a basic human right and uh, Palestinians are entitled to a quick resolution on that matter. Um, and again, um, if resolving water uh, issues can be a practical attainable solution today, um, it can definitely be an attempt towards a, a a better understanding of the conflict and uh, potentially a step forward uh, towards trust building for discussing more complicated files. Thank you. Thank you, Dual, please. Yeah, um, I would like to sum up and uh, just to say again uh, what I said before that water, the water question or the inequality of water dissemination is, of course, part or another angle to look at the, at the horrific. Uh, re political reality uh, in the West Bank uh, altogether. Um, of course, it touches the most vital needs of uh, human communities, water, in this case. Um, I wanted to thank also uh, Avner for correcting me before, because what I said, when I, when I said that Palestinians are collecting water, so I meant basically Palestinians collecting water or can collect water in areas where they're um, construction is allowed. In the West Bank, it's, um, the areas where Palestinians can um, safely build is concentrated to more or less 40% uh, of, the, of the area. So in these area, there's no problem. There are no problems to collect water in water pits, water cistern, and so on. This is what I said before when I answered. Of course, whatever uh, the Israeli authorities uh, consider as so-called illegal, yeah, so there, in these places, we can see uh, we can see systematic and contiguous uh, demolitions of water infrastructure. And one, it can be water pipes. It can be also, of course, uh, water cisterns and pits, as we have seen uh, before. Uh, last thing, thank you for hosting uh, hosting me, and I hope that this, was, uh, this presentation was uh, useful in order to understand the reality on the ground. Thank you, Dual. Would you like to make a, one uh, last uh, comment before we conclude?
Okay, so um, we in uh, Combatants for Peace believe uh, it is uh, our obligation uh, to struggle together for uh, equal access to water for Palestinians in Area C, and we invite you to join uh, the struggle. Please, uh, I once again urge you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, if you're here, you can stand with us, literally, physically, on the ground. If you're overseas, you can donate and support us in different ways. The links are in the chat. The campaign is supported in many different ways by other organizations, some uh, um, some representatives of which are here in the, uh, in the audience, uh, including uh, OMEP, Machon Arava, One Climate, Ecopis, Kerem Navot, Bimkom, and, and many more. I want to thank you for, for being here. I want to, to thank the speakers today uh, for illuminating us. Uh, and it's also a, a good opportunity to thank uh, Beth Schumann and the American Friends of Combatants for Peace who support us in this campaign and Mehra Rime from Bait of Hope in Geneva. Um, I want to thank Adam Rabi, uh, the Palestinian campaign coordinator, Iris Gour and Eli Shalev for producing this webinar and all other activists in the water campaign team. Special thanks to Rassan Banoura and Yali Marom Dak, our committed uh, uh, media officers who helped us uh, uh, pull this together. I thank uh, Marina and Rafa for the translation and finally, Thank you all for being with us. Good night or good day, wherever you may be. Thank you all.